It is a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome Akhil Palanasamy uh, and Rebecca Katz to the new school. Akhil is a Harvard-trained physician who practices integrative medicine, blending his conventional medical expertise with evidence-based holistic approaches, including functional medicine and Ayurveda. He studied biochemistry at Harvard and completed his medical training at the University of California, San Francisco and Stanford, and he's widely known as a speaker and educator. He lives in San Francisco, and his book is the focus of our conversation today. It's a really extraordinary book called The Paleovedic Diet, a complete program to burn fat, increase energy, and reverse disease. Rebecca Katz is director of the Healing Kitchens Institute at Commonweal. She has been at Commonweal for how long now? 16 years, 16 17 years. years. Started uh, in the kitchen at Pacific House <laughs> and uh, became uh, an extraordinary culinary educator. Um, and uh, her most recent book, The Healthy Mind Cookbook, Big Flavor Recipes to Enhance Brain Function, Mood, Memory, and Mental Clarity, uh, is um, also a... A remarkable contribution. Um, uh, Rebecca works with uh, Dale Bredesen at the Buck Institute on Aging, and uh, Bredesen's program on reversing cognitive decline is of more than passing interest than a, for a number of us in the room here. <laughs> and uh, I must confess that I am following it as closely as I can and um, am learning a, a great deal for it. From it, and uh, Bredesen uses Rebecca's uh, cookbook mm -hmm. in his programs. Uh, so we have two extraordinary people here with us today, and Rebecca is going to help me uh, talk with Akil because her expertise in this is much greater than mine. So, Akil, welcome. Thank you for having me. Let's start with a simple question What is the Paleovedic diet? Yes, that's a, that's a great question, and um, I, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here with, uh, you know, with, with all of you, with, um, the, with my, Rebecca and Michael and everybody in the room. Um, it's a coming home for me because I, I was um, mentioning earlier that in 1999, as a medical student at UCSF, I came to Commonweal for a retreat on um, student well-being. And, uh, with Rachel, with Naomi, Rachel Remen, right? yes, yeah. and um, you know that course, and you know, and this that retreat and the, the whole experience was really um, seminal for me during my medical training. Um, so, were you one of the cool. organizers of the program at UCSF? Do I remember that correctly? Yes, yeah, the the Healers Art, and the also Healers Art yes, and yeah. and also the Integrative Medicine Network oh, at wonderful. UCSF. So, yeah. so it's just well, so great welcome, to be here. welcome back, yeah. welcome yeah. home. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, briefly, the um, a paleo-Vedic diet is a customized, uh, nutrient-dense paleo diet. Mm -hmm. And the, the whole reason I wrote the book was because um, so many of my patients were following a paleo diet, but they thought of it as just, you know, meat, just maybe burgers or, um, you know, just essentially meat and a few vegetables. And I really wanted to emphasize that it's, it should be a plant-based diet mm -hmm. um, with um, vegetables and fruits as a foundation. Um, I know that you emphasize that a lot as well, Rebecca. And, um, and also I, I found that um, it was unnecessarily restrictive for a lot of people. You know, um, the paleo diet typically recommends cutting out legumes, um, cutting out all grains, cutting out dairy. And I found for my patients that many of them actually could benefit from some of those foods, you know, perhaps from uh, fermented dairy or um, properly prepared legumes, or in some cases, even gluten-free grains. And um, that's where Ayurveda comes in because um, Ayurveda believes in customizing a diet for each person. And so I was able to use Ayurveda to help people customize paleo for themselves. And that's where I came up with the concept initially. And for those who are not familiar with Ayurvedic uh, uh, medicine and Ayurvedic diet, what is Ayurveda? So Ayurveda is the um, traditional system of medicine from India, and it's uh, at least 3,000 years old. And uh, it emphasizes diet and nutrition as a foundation of good health, and also emphasizes um, customizing um, the diet and lifestyle program for each person. It believes that every person is unique and has a distinct body type, and that the diet should be tailored to that body type and you know customized to the seasons, 
Um, eating local was you know, one of the original Ayurvedic concepts. Uh, so food should be tailored to the season, to local environment, to each person, to their goals at that time, um, and to the time of day even. So it, it really um, takes the uh, science of customization you know, to the next level with nutrition. So give us just a brief sense of what vata, pitta, and kapha are in Ayurveda. Sure. So, those, so vata, pitta, and kapha are the three doshas or forces that are the foundation of Ayurveda. You can think of vata very simply as wind, mm -hmm. and pitta is analogous to fire, and um, kapha is um, comparable to earth. And it's the balance of these forces that ultimately determines health. And um, imbalance is what leads to disease eventually. So, so each okay. individual is some different ratio of those three. Is exactly. Yes. So everybody's born with a unique combination of vata, pitta, and kapha. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, one person might be 50% vata, 30% kapha, and 20% uh, pitta. And the goal in Ayurveda is always to uh, let your true self shine through and to return to your true self or your true nature. So the goal is not to attain you know, equal amounts of all three doshas. So that same person we described, you know, you're not trying to get 33% of each of the three doshas. You're trying to um, return to that original balance of 50% vata and 30% kapha and 20% pitta. So you're trying to restore that balance, which um, always tends to be out of balance with, you know, life and diet and stress, but you're trying to return to your true constitution. So, for example, if a person had a primary vata constitution yes. and uh, was eating uh, uh, and, and was sort of getting too far out on their vata dimension right. and was eating cold, uncooked foods and drinking mm -hmm. cold water, mm -hmm. what would happen to them? So, the, their vata would tend to increase and uh, become excessive. And um, the word dosha in Sanskrit actually uh, is, could be translated as defect. So, um, you know, it's not an exact translation, but the idea is that there is a tendency to get out of balance right. in a certain way for each of us. So the whole idea behind prevention is that uh, prevention also should be individualized because every person is prone to different diseases. You know, we know that in Western medicine, you know, why does some one person get heart disease and another person gets arthritis and another person gets cancer. Well, Ayurveda can actually help um, tailor prevention to the, the dosha tendency to get out of balance. And so therefore, um, with your, the example you mentioned of a vata person, um, they would need to uh, follow a vata balancing program to get themselves into balance and, and then express the positive qualities of vata, you know, which are creativity, um, um, you know, very high energy accomplishment while still remaining grounded. So you, there's always positive and negative aspects to every dosha and you want to try to express the most positive qualities. Uh, and, you know, in our true nature, all of us have those tendencies and strengths and weaknesses and Ayurveda um, helps each of us kind of achieve that potential. Mm -hmm. And what is functional medicine? You write uh, deliberately as uh, someone who has both benefited from functional medicine and as part of the functional medicine community. Most people haven't heard of functional medicine. What is functional medicine? Yes, so functional medicine essentially looks at the optimizing the function of different systems in the body. Mm -hmm. So that could be the digestive system, it could be the hormonal system, it could be the detoxification mm -hmm. pathways. So um, I, I like to think there's a commonality between Ayurveda and functional medicine, mm -hmm. which are the two main modalities that I practice. And um, that, uh, I think of Ayurveda as original functional medicine, you know, looking at the function of all of the different systems in the body. And then modern functional medicine actually takes a different approach using testing. So mm -hmm. using, using um, specialized laboratory testing beyond what um, a conventional physician might do but to assess the function of these different systems. And then often um, you can also prevent um, a, a person from developing a full-blown disease if you catch the imbalances early enough, perhaps when they're just healthy or if they have nonspecific symptoms, functional medicine can help uh, reverse imbalance before it progresses to disease, mm -hmm. the same way that Ayurveda tries to achieve that. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I've uh, been studying functional medicine quite intensively for the last four years. I mm-hmm. knew Jeff Bland, one of the founders of functional medicine, mm-hmm. uh, over the last 30 years or so, but I didn't really study it uh, until the last four years. And, uh, and uh, just for those who are not familiar with this, um, functional medicine, uh, one could say it's a subset of integrative medicine. So if you see integrative medicine as the broad field, and perhaps you might consider Andrew Weil uh, as one of the kind of godfathers of integrative medicine. He has the program uh, uh, which you trained in at the uh, mm-hmm. University of Arizona and uh, which Anna O'Malley, uh, our uh, wonderful Bellinus physician, uh, trained in as well. Um, functional medicine is a subset of that in a certain sense. But there are certain tensions which are Uh, useful Mm -hmm. between integrative and functional medicine. So you have many practitioners who, uh, for for example, there is a a group of people, I believe you're part of the functional medicine group, you and Cynthia and others uh, in Mm -hmm. the Bay Area who study functional medicine together. Um, But uh, there's a certain tension between functional medicine and integrative medicine. So uh, from the point of view, if I may say so, of functional medicine, Functional medicine might be seen as kind of taking integrative medicine further, you know. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot more testing of uh, different, you know, levels of nutrients and so forth and different capacities in the body. Um, and there's also perhaps a good deal uh, more supplementation by some practitioners. Mm-hmm. Now, you don't use a lot of supplements in your approach, is that correct? I try to be pretty focused and targeted with supplements right. and rely on diet right. primarily. But there are other functional medicine practitioners who do prescribe quite a few uh, yes. supplements. Um, and so uh, from the point of view of functional medicine, it takes uh, integrative medicine further. Mm-hmm. From the point of view of some integrative medicine practitioners, it takes it too far. Mm-hmm. There are some integrative medicine practitioners who believe it outruns the data and they believe that uh, there are too many expensive tests and supplements and so on. Mm-hmm. So there's a useful creative tension at the interface. Right. Is, does that strike you as fair? Yes, uh, I think that um, I've also really noticed that tension. Um, mm-hmm. And I think um, um, you know, there, there are so many different pathways to healing right. and you know, integrative medicine encompasses so many different approaches. Um, so I think that functional medicine is just one approach, you know, right. um, one way to the, the mountaintop, if, if you right. will. And, right. um, but I think within integrative medicine, um, there is some resentment mm-hmm. towards functional medicine mm-hmm. because uh, um, uh, one of the, the things is that the emphasis on testing, you know, is, is, mm-hmm. so, um, is so strong that mm-hmm. some people believe it, it detracts from the idea of um, intuition and incorporating a more holistic approach mm-hmm. and really listening to the patient and, you know, all those elements that are so vital to integrative medicine. Um, and then the other aspect is that um, the research behind functional medicine testing is so um, nascent in terms yeah. of the length of time that it's been going on, and it's evolving so rapidly. Um, so some people believe that all these tests are not ready for prime time. You know, exactly. to really use with patients. Uh, you don't really have the same evidence for functional medicine that you do for conventional medicine. You know, that is certain. Um, There's another piece of that, which is that there is a synergistic relationship between functional medicine and the supplement and diagnostic testing companies Mm -hmm. that is not dissimilar to the relationship between conventional medicine and big pharma, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so there are concerns about the degree to which uh, that is influencing the practice and the testing and so forth. So on the other hand, uh, you know, that's the critique. On the other hand, neither integrative nor functional medicine are reimbursed appropriately in our system. Mm -hmm. So how are people supposed to make a living, you know? And so what functional medicine has done by driving the equivalent of big pharma in the supplement and diagnostic things is to create an industry with both its strengths and its weaknesses Mm -hmm. that is driving the field forward and bringing things uh, toward the level at which they probably should become mm-hmm. part of medical practice. So it's that right. creative tension between integrative and functional medicine, the critiques on both sides, but a lot of actual practitioners define themselves 
neither as purely functional nor as purely integrative, but as integrating the two. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. 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 And I think with functional medicine as well, they've done a good job of um, getting some of these tests covered by insurance. Yes. Um, so uh, I think that's very important in terms of making them more accessible you mm -hmm. know, to, to more people. Yeah. Because one of the critiques about integrated medicine is that um, it's more, uh, you know, for high income people, it's not accessible to the underserved. Mm -hmm. um, but um, for example, with a lot of the functional medicine tests, they've been able to get Medicare coverage for mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these, mm -hmm. this testing which um, um, makes it a lot more accessible. And then, you know, you get, of course, a lot of data that you have to interpret, but having that accessibility and insurance coverage helps move that aspect within the realm of, mm -hmm. you know, more mainstream. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another um, strength of functional medicine. I agree with that. Rebecca Katz, you have been uh, really an important part of the integrative and functional medicine communities with your work. Uh, you present at many functional medicine conferences and um, are very highly regarded for your culinary educational role. Um, and you emailed me uh, this morning saying, Akil's book is fantastic. <laughs> uh, so uh, I wanted you to join with me in this conversation because I am a rank amateur in this work. And I really wanted to ask you from your perspective, what do you think Akhil has brought to the field? Well, a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I always, I'm always looking for that, just because I always come from behind the stove, mm -hmm. because I was trained first as a cook, mm -hmm. and, um, and then I, I got my master's of uh, science and nutrition, only to be able to understand the nutrition so it could translate to the plate. Mm -hmm. But I'm always interested in what's happening behind the stove. And what I love about your work is that you put the food so beautifully front and center. And the book to me is this wonderful invitation for people to look at this way of eating, not in a kind of restrictive way that sometimes when we hear about paleo or vegan or vegetarian or I'm, I'm, this, I'm, I'm this diet, I'm this diet, I'm this diet, it's like identifying with something outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. But really um, saying here there's, this, there's, there's an individual way of going and I, I feel that, um, again, coming from a culinary perspective and working with people who come to me with the lists <laughs> of the, I cannot eat, the can't, the list, I call it the list, right? And there's so often people will, will come um, and my readers will, will uh, communicate with me that everything is so, it's like, um, Everybody feels like, oh my gosh, I, nutritional analysis leads mm -hmm. to culinary paralysis. So there, you address this. <laughs> you address this so beautifully. I, I feel like there is mm -hmm. this, this so much nutritional nutritionalism, as Michael Pollan would call it, out there for the consumer that they and you talk about it so openly that you know people are confused. Like, what is right for me mm -hmm. um, and what's right for one person is not right for another person. And I think you bring a tremendous amount of clarity to that issue. And there's one, there's one, there were many phrases, many things that you talked about that just resonated so clear from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one is that flexibility, you know, mm -hmm. that people are different. And, but really this idea of the middle way, mm -hmm. everything in my, as my, my, my great grandmother would say, everything in moderation, including moderation, mm -hmm. but right. it's that, it's that middle way, as you say, the healthy middle ground, which is so much the root of Ayurveda. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I also, I, so I, and the other words that, um, that rang true to me mm -hmm. was your 
saying as you were going through your own healing journey and you found food to be you food to be your medicine mm -hmm. um, you said there were two words that your ayurvedic practitioner said and the two words were bone broth <laughs> <laughs> right right and um Bone broth was the path to recovery, restoration, and vitality. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to just engage you for a bit about your relationship with food mm -hmm. um, because I, I also noticed just, again, kind of being a culinary translator, that people tend to kind of um, get stuck mm -hmm. In, in a way that may not be serving them. And I wanted you to talk about your experience with food and how it evolved to this mm -hmm. place, um, which is so rich in color and um, herbs and spices and all the things that we love so much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, mm -hmm. for your kind words. I'm a huge fan of your of your work. And, thank you. Uh, um, and yeah, so I think the, you know, the reference to bone broth, um, you know, that was um, actually back in 1999 uh, when my Ayurvedic practitioner recommended that. And that was before bone broth was really Pop right, thing. It the, right, it was before it was the yeah. trend. Right, before it was really popular. And, you know, no one had heard of it. I couldn't find it in any stores. I had to I had to make it there. Now you can find it in, you know, Whole Foods, a lot of stores. But um, in terms of how I got to that point, um, it was actually um, during my medical training, my medical school, when I was um, uh, faced with a pretty um, severe chronic illness. And uh, um, mainly um, like a repetitive strain injury type thing with chronic pain and weight loss. And um, it was severe enough to the point where I had to take a year off of medical school and uh, could no longer, you know, write or type on the computer or um, study even. And uh, at that point, I had um, actually been a vegetarian for about three years and uh, had um, come to that during college from a place of trying to eat healthier and, you know, following more of a yoga lifestyle and uh, um, more for ethical reasons. And um, I, even though um, many people in my life were opposed to that and saying that, you know, I probably needed some meat, I um, really felt that um, I didn't. And, uh, um, I, and I saw no real link between my health and the changes in diet because I thought I had really moved my diet to the most um, healthy place and, uh, you know, there was nothing left to be done there. Um, and so when I saw this Ayurvedic practitioner, you know, and she mentioned bone broth, it was a big struggle for me because that was an animal product. Right. And uh, that involved, um, you know, getting bones, even though I wasn't going to eat the, the meat. And uh, so it was a, a big struggle. It, it took like a couple of months for me to, you know, even get to the point where I was willing to um, try bone broth. And um, the... Um, uh, and I convinced myself it was okay because there was no meat on it. And this was something that was going to be discarded and, um, you know, it was okay. And, but I, I really felt um, pretty rapidly the change in my, in my body. And, uh, and that, was, um, that was for me, you know, just um, a reminder about that flexibility that you were talking about. Because, um, you know, I was a member of the San Francisco Vegetarian Society and um, was like a speaker. <laughs> I was like a speaker at their events. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was... Uh, um, I was um, helping a friend who was developing like a, a vegan burger. And so I was like, really, <laughs> I was really into that, that world. And, right. you know, and I, um, for, for a long time, you know, just felt that uh, um, that was the thing, you know, that was, that was right. I mean, that, that was for me. And uh, so um, it was a big lesson for me to learn flexibility the hard way, because after, you know, I think um, when you suffer in pain long enough, then you're willing to try anything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was, um, it was I, can't, I had come to that point. And, uh, uh, and then for me, eventually my Ayurvedic practitioner suggested trying a little bit of, of meat and alma protein. And uh, I, you know, really noticed a huge difference. And, um, and I think for oh, me- Will you yeah. tell the story? Yeah. There's a wonderful story that you tell oh, in okay. the book um, about your, you ordering a chicken sandwich. Right, and right and contemplating before you eat it and, and waiting for a sign. Will you tell that story? Because oh, yes. it's just such a great story. <laughs> yeah, so 
This was actually the um, very first time that I was trying to eat meat after about four years. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to do it, um, you know, very uh, consciously. And uh, so I uh, got a chicken sandwich from the, you know, UCSF cafeteria. And then I um, just went to a quiet, quiet room and meditated and then um, <laughs> asked, you know, asked for a sign. And then, um, so, yeah, and then I, as I was eating the sandwich, I bit into something hard. And, uh, and I was wondering, you know, what is this? And I um, took it out of my mouth. It was actually a piece of paper that was rolled up. And um, <laughs> it, um, it's, so it had a word on it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, and the word was um, ration. <laughs> so somehow that piece of paper got into that sandwich, and uh, um, but um, to to me, you know, it was uh, it was very meaningful, right? Yeah, because, uh, because I could I could relate to that. It was a, a ration, you know, uh, which is something that you, in a time of need, you have in you know in small quantities and um, for a specific purpose, you know, maybe to save your life. And um, so it's, um, for me, that, you know, that really, um, and I guess more important than that was the way I felt when right. I, you know, when I was started eating meat. And that was the whole um, lesson for me was just reconnecting with my body and paying attention to how I felt after eating food and realizing that I had not been feeling well after eating vegetarian food for many months, but had not really paid attention to that and uh, was somewhat disconnected, which is, you know, very common in medical school. <laughs> but um, that helped me to just reconnect with my body and, and realize that, okay, maybe the universe is trying to send me a message. <laughs> right. And, you know, I think it's very, I, I, I love these stories because they happen more than I think people realize, right? right. When, we're, when we're kind of mindful and paying attention and these kind of little signs come in. And I think it's, it, we all struggle, like, when you knew when your when your practitioner suggested gently suggested that you start with bone broth because and being respectful of you mm -hmm. right and that it took you a couple of months to get there and i think one of the things that people don't realize mm -hmm. um, is that when we're trying to make change and shift that it doesn't happen necessarily like that mm -hmm. that there there is kind of this process that we go through a letting go of because you know food is an emotional issue and right, right. and our kind of our habits are um we're tied into our our habits or what we think might work for us it's it's hard to kind of let go and make mm -hmm. that shift so i i i think that's important for people to understand mm -hmm. that these transitions that we might go through just don't don't happen like this mm -hmm. and I just thought that was such an elegant way of you know of re that reminder that's like sometimes these things you know they we get kind of slapped on the head right. and we realize that we go back to in some ways for you back a little bit back to your roots mm -hmm. right yeah I, and I think that's um that's a great point because um it's uh, sometimes it's really a struggle you know to uh to change your ideas about food and um it can, it can be very difficult to you know yeah. to, to do that and um I think for me the um the you know one of the main lessons of that whole experience was just open-mindedness and and you know asking myself the question um what if there's something that I don't know about nutrition that could change everything you know uh. and um I ask myself that question a lot because if I'm writing a book now and you know and uh I, I don't want to kind of get in that same trap again you know and um and and think that um okay now I've this is the truth or this is the way, you know, and just to constantly ask myself, what is it we don't know? What is it that we could be adding to our you know, ideas about nutrition and just, um, you know, reminding myself about that. So. Can, can I go on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have like two sheets here. <laughs> no, I, I wanted, I want, I think one of the interesting things what I love about, um, uh, your writing. First of all, uh, you do a lot of, and you call it this, um, myth busting. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, in, I would love you to talk about some of the myths that you bust, especially in regards to the quote unquote paleo 
diet because mm -hmm. really what you have done is you have been, I call this the culinary confessional. Mm -hmm. It's like people come and they talk about some of, you know, like, oh my gosh, I love, like for me, if mm -hmm. I were, if I were in your office, right? Mm -hmm. I, I say I'm coming to the culinary confessional and doctor, I really love potatoes. <laughs> and I like have this emotional attachment to my potatoes. <laughs> And I can give up gluten and I can give up dairy and I can give up this and that. But my gosh, if you take my potatoes away, I just, I think I'll just mm -hmm. die. And um, <laughs> life will not be worth living. And yet you have, you have, what you have done is you've given people like a way for them to incorporate foods that, that in other paleo books are mm -hmm. forbidden, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and you've, so you've opened the universe and you've, you've given solutions. So I was wondering if you could talk through some of the myths mm -hmm. and talk about, especially, um, I'm interested in your view on carbohydrates because I think, you know, every decade, mm -hmm. um, Americans take a, a, a major macronutrient and throw it under the bus. Right, right. So in the, <laughs> like in the 90s, it was fat. Everything was fat-free, right? right. And, and then- you know, and then, you know, now it's, it's carbohydrates and mm -hmm. sugar is always thrown under the bus. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love if you would talk about really what carbohydrates are mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and kind of maybe clarify what carbohydrates are, because I don't mm -hmm. think people really understand. Sure. Yeah. No, that's a great question. And I think, uh, the whole idea behind, um, um, the book was because so many of my patients were telling me these, what I thought were untruths about, you know, paleo. And, uh, that's kind of what, why I, um, wrote some of those ideas. And, um, uh, I came to that, uh, actually from Ayurveda because Ayurveda is really very inclusive in terms of what it uh, recommends. You know, there's really no, um, Ayurvedic book out there that demonizes a nutrient or a category of foods, uh, or, you know, uh, in the same way that other diet books do. And, um, in fact, when I um, told some of my Ayurvedic colleagues that I was writing a book on paleo, I got some strange looks <laughs> because, um, you know, paleo is really very restrictive in the mainstream. And, um, for example, um, legumes, so like lentils and beans um, in Ayurveda, you know, highly emphasized. But um, some paleo books say that actually our ancestors did not really eat legumes. But if you look at the um, more the later you know, research and anthropological evidence, it is pretty clear that a lot of our ancestors did eat legumes. And um, so that if you want to argue, uh, you know, what did our paleolithic ancestors eat? They did, they did, you know, and legumes would actually be in that category. But the key thing is it, they have to be properly prepared and, you know, um, soaked if you're um, uh, preparing them from dry legumes to remove um, some of the anti-nutrients and other things. Um, and then if, you're, if they're properly prepared and consumed, they can actually be a very healthy part of the diet. Um, so legumes are one example. I think um, with carbohydrates, yeah, yeah you're, you're completely right in terms of the, I think this is the era of demonizing carbohydrates and uh, um, fat is kind of popular again. So, right, so, yeah. Yeah. that's, that's so, fat yeah. again, right. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's okay to have your, you know, your bacon and other, you know, other fats. Um, so, yeah, so I think with carbohydrates, it's really a matter of the, um, the quality of the carbohydrates and, um, you know, in terms of um, whether if you're having whole foods and, you uh, um, in which includes, you know, not just fruits and vegetables, but root vegetables like potatoes, if that is your, your favorite, um, and, uh, you know, sweet potatoes, other tubers. These were all part of our um, ancestral diets, you know, like starchy tubers and roots, root vegetables. That was what our ancestors consumed, you know, for, for energy. I mean, they, um, they would not be able to hunt and kill an animal every day. You know, I mean, um, meat was uh, was sort of a, a not a, a daily thing, and um, when you when they got it, they ate it for sure because of the, the nutrients. But um, the tubers, root vegetables, um, you know, of course, nuts and seeds. Um, so all of these are um, are part of I think the paleo diet originally, 
And um, so with carbohydrates, it's really more about eliminating the processed, you know, the flours, the uh, refined grains, um, the, um, uh, of course, some of the sweeteners that are made, you know, from the corn syrup and, and those kind of things. And just relying on whole foods and complex carbohydrates and, uh, and, and realizing that uh, we all need carbohydrates, you know, for um, not just for energy, but um, um, for our gut bacteria, you know, there, our gut bacteria live on carbohydrates and uh, they're uh, essential, the fiber that the carbohydrates provide um, and very important for neurotransmitters, you know, your serotonin production. So there's so many reasons why carbohydrates are beneficial and it's just a matter of um, having the right amount and, uh, you know, and figuring out what you feel good on. Um, but I think that Carbohydrates do not deserve the sort of treatment that they're getting. <laughs> right. Speaking of potatoes, uh, you know, one of the things about this book is it is so dense in useful pearls, what they call clinical pearls yeah. mm -hmm. of information. So talk a little about how to prepare potatoes mm -hmm. so that they actually metabolize better. Yes, that's a that's a great question, um, Michael. And you know, the with potatoes in this in this country, um, every person consumes about 142 pounds of potatoes uh, per year. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem is that 50% um, of that is in the form of French fries. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so, again, we're talking about the processed food versus the whole food. Um, so um, potatoes actually. Um, you know, as a whole food are quite nutritious. You know, you could you could subsist on potatoes, um, like in the movie The Martian. You know, right. You, know, <laughs> so you could just grow potatoes and you could live on them. And um, no, but seriously. Um, so I think one way to prepare potatoes that where, where they're more nutritious is actually um, if you cook them in some way, whether it's um, you know boiling or steaming them, and then refrigerate them for 24 hours, the starch uh, changes to make something known as resistant starch, which is um, much lower glycemic. So it raises the blood sugar more slowly. And also it's resistant starch feeds your good bacteria that make up your microbiome. So if you um, cook the potatoes that way and then chill them for 24 hours and have them the next day, you can actually still heat them up or, and you won't lose that, that starch. So that's one way to, um, to ha have potatoes in a, you know, in a healthier way. Uh, and I, I do think also that sweet potatoes are a very good um, option as well, in addition to potatoes, because- uh, You mentioned uh, the microbiome. And uh, again, one of the big, uh, uh, emphases of functional medicine is gut bacteria and the yes. microbiome. Could you mm -hmm. say a little about uh, gut bacteria? Yes, yeah. Well, um, you know, we could say a lot about gut right. bacteria because uh, <laughs> every, um, every week there's a new study that comes out right. about right. The, the gut bacteria. But basically, um, the more we learn, the more we realize this is absolutely fundamental to health. Um, and also, that imbalances in the gut bacteria uh, may be one of the key driving factors for um, many chronic diseases, certainly for autoimmune disease, um, of which there are you know, over 100 different varieties. We know that um, changes in gut bacteria, changes in uh, intestinal permeability are one of the root causes. Um, the leaky gut. The, yeah, the leaky gut, um, which um, is more and more backed up by research. Mm -hmm. um, and so the gut bacteria, we know they are um, very important for your immune system because about at least 60% of the immune cells in the body are in the gut. And uh, the, there's the gut-brain axis and connection. So um, most of the neurotransmitters um, in the body are made in the gut. So the gut bacteria influence mood a lot. They influence, um, um, you know, your, your mental state. And then, of course, with digestion, they synthesize key uh, vitamins and minerals, and then they help with um, making enzymes to digest the food. Um, and then they make um, short-chain fatty acids, which are the main energy source for your intestinal cells. So if you have a good gut uh, microbiome, then all of those functions are, um, you know, being perform optimally, and that's vital to good health. And antibiotics throw them way off. Yes, that's And true. fermented foods are good for them. Yes, fermented foods are, um, you know, one of the um, categories of food that are um, from traditional societies, mm -hmm. that they were always consumed. Mm -hmm. And 
the yeah, it is true with antibiotics that mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're necessary and you know they might be life saving, mm -hmm. but they are over prescribed um, mm -hmm. definitely in 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 the West, mm -hmm. and it can take um, studies show that it can take up to a year, so twelve months or sometimes eighteen months after a course of antibiotics mm -hmm. for the microbiome to really recover mm -hmm. back to normal. So that's after one course of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So imagine, especially many of our children, you know, they're taking antibiotics every couple of months for, you know, um, ear infections or other, um, other things. So um, that, that sort of thing does have a big impact on the, on the microbiome. And they're uh, also yeah. disturbed by non-vaginal birth delivery, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So the main way that you establish your microbiome is um, at childbirth when you're exposed to the um, flora and bacteria in the vaginal canal. Mm -hmm. So babies that are born by a, a cesarean section don't have that opportunity. And so they, they get a different flora initially. And mm -hmm. uh, if they're breastfed and, um, you know, uh, they can reestablish some of that because breastfeeding is also very important for establishing the microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, but um, these are some of the many factors that have led to um, you know, uh, kind of um, widespread disruption of the microbiome among you know all people. I want to take people on a short tour of the whole book because we can never cover all of the extraordinary work here. Mm -hmm. But part one is called "Fuel Your Body Optimally," and it starts with talking about hunter gatherers and blue zones. Say a word about what blue zones are. Yeah. So the blue blue zones are um, basically. Uh, very um, long-lived societies around the world. So researchers have found um, about five or six of these blue zones that um, kind of uh, um, don't um, have the same chronic diseases of Western civilization. So they're sort of exceptions to modern society. So Loma society. Linda and Seventh-day Adventists is one example in the United States. Yes, exactly. An example in yeah. Japan, I believe. Yeah, Okinawa is Okinawa. another example, right. and then some examples from Greece and Italy. And, but people so. eat different diets in these different places. That's exactly it. So the, there's no one blue zone diet. Exactly. Um, but um, there are lessons that we can learn from all these societies, and that's what I try to integrate. And in some of the commonalities are deep social networks, social support, and right. also, very beautifully, a sense of purpose, a reason to get up in the morning. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very lovely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it's Which hard feeds to, deeply into yeah. the work we think about a lot, mm -hmm. about the significance of meaning in our lives as, mm -hmm. a, as a powerful healing force. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. And then you go on to carbs, grains, and gluten, and you do a lot with uh, all of those. We've been talking about that. Uh, fats and proteins and their importance. Then uh, the fourth chapter is on unknown superfoods. And again, we're just doing a quick tour, but maximizing nutrient density. Uh, say a word about superfoods. Sure. So um, by superfoods, I'm actually talking about fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so mm -hmm. people, people might think it's something you know, very um, uh, unusual, but actually I'm talking about um, how to get most of the nutrients out of fruits and vegetables because people don't realize that um, you know, wild um, plants had much more nutrients than our um, modern plants mm -hmm. that we're exposed to. So, um, so I um, talk about how to um, choose you know, certain fruits and vegetables that have um, more nutrients and are closer to the wild versions. So for example, with apples, there was an interesting study that found that the um, modern ginger gold apples, which you can get in the supermarket, compared to the um, wild apples from Nepal, there's a percentage difference in nutrients of 47,500 uh, percent. So, um, so uh, between they're both apples, but they're um, that's just, a bit of a difference. Isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah, and uh, I think yeah, you know, it's not um, really widely um, spoken about, but mm -hmm. there's really there's really a huge um, difference made when you can choose the right you know fruits and vegetables and. Uh, these are the phytochemicals that are protecting us against disease, you know, heart disease, cancer. So it's absolutely important to get the maximum amount through the diet. Mm -hmm. So that's the focus of that chapter. Then the fifth, we've talked about heal the gut, heal the body. And the sixth, we've talked about Ayurvedic body type. But then the seventh is a wonderful one. You know, I'm a, I'm a rudimentary cook. My wife, Cheryl Patton, who's here, uh, is a fantastic cook. And... Um, but one of the things I've never mastered is spices. So mm -hmm. partly inspired by your book, I went to Whole Foods and bought myself 10 spices and oh, began great. to experiment. But 
you have a wonderful chapter on the kitchen pharmacy with a lot of the science on 12 powerful healing spices. So talk a little about your favorite spice. Oh, sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think um, turmeric, of course, mm -hmm. is, uh, is top, of, top of the list because um, I, I think we've all, we've all heard of turmeric and the you know, effect on inflammation and cancer prevention. Um, but I think um, ginger is also surprisingly powerful, you mm -hmm. know, as, um, f um, with the same effects um, as is cinnamon. I mm -hmm. think cinnamon, you know, may not be um, emphasized the same way. Um, and then the one, probably the single um, best spice for cancer uh, prevention, mm -hmm. at least th that we know of, or the top two, besides turmeric, is black cumin, mm -hmm. because uh, there's a lot of research on black cumin and you know the effects of, of that spice on um, mm -hmm. on cancer prevention. Um, the um, Dr. Agarwal from the MD Anderson Cancer Center mm -hmm. in um, uh, in Texas, he. Um, he really believes that black cumin um, is maybe the most important spice for cancer prevention and, and treatment. And uh, um, so, um, yeah, and you know, I think um, the spices are considered medicine in Ayurveda, just like, uh, you know, food is medicine, but um, spices are very powerful medicine and learning how to use them correctly can really make a huge difference in, for, for your health. Not to mention the yum factor. Yes. Because yes. they add so much flavor to foods. They right. serve as two purposes. Yes, exactly. And the other beautiful thing about spices is that uh, if you compare them to nutritional supplements, mm -hmm. I mean, we all know the supplement industry is just a disaster in terms of the lack of oversight of any meaningful kind of what's actually in the supplements, mm -hmm. right? right? Plus, you make the point that, that foods deliver whole nutrients in ways that the supplements can't. And the prices are very high. So it's really, uh, you know, it's kind of Russian roulette about mm -hmm. whether uh, a, a supplement is actually gonna help you or do nothing or hurt you, you mm -hmm. know? Right. It's, whereas spices, much less expensive, good science, and less likely to be harmful or completely adulterated in some way. Is that a mm -hmm. fair? Yes. Statement. Yeah. So really, right. learning yeah. spices, which I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. is uh, is a real um, key. And I think people don't think about that spices as much as they think about foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I think that um, the key thing with spices is that um, in Ayurveda, you know, we believe that uh, you don't really have to take a supplement, but right. you know, for spices, right. it really should be you know in the food. Right. And um, like for example, with turmeric, uh, studies have shown that when you combine turmeric with black pepper uh, and some fat the absorption increases by 2,000%. Mm. And, you know, in traditional cooking, it, most curries have the black pepper and the turmeric and the ghee, you know, all combined. Mm. And there was a, a reason for that. And mm -hmm. um, same thing with uh, cloves. So mm -hmm. there was a study that looked at uh, actually clove consumption and found that um, um, just a simple culinary small quantity of clove every day for seven days was able to lower blood markers of inflammation mm -hmm. and um, you know, immune system uh, mm -hmm. dysfunction. So just in seven days of um, incorporating cloves into the diet you know, mm -hmm. um, in cooking amounts. So mm -hmm. it's really about just using it in the diet and um, you know, learning how to cook with them. The second section, exercise, sleep, and mind, body, spirit, balance. Again, extraordinary stuff, but the, the, first, the first one, on Ayurvedic tips and intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. So the Bredesen program, which Rebecca works with on reversing cognitive decline, part of that is at least a 12 to 13 hour fast every day. And so that's the one, the piece that I'm practicing most strongly on that. And mm -hmm. um, uh, say a little about what it does if you fast, say 12 to 16 hours a day and then eat in a a 12 to eight hour window. What are mm -hmm. the metabolic shifts that take place and why are they important? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, fasting is um, very strongly emphasized in Ayurveda yeah. for um, the ability to um, clear toxins. And then the belief is that all your cells uh, renew themselves when you fast. And that's actually been confirmed by science, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that does happen. But it's um, 
Intermittent fasting gives you the benefits of fasting, but it's more um, sustainable because it's it's not as extreme like the version you described, where you're eating in just a, a window of eight to twelve hours. Um, in the remaining time of the day, um, um, you know, there's um, notable changes in um, in stress hormones, in um, your blood sugar regulation, um, and also in immune function. So. Um, when you're incorporating that uh, intermittent fasting schedule, the immune system does um, have an effect on, um, you know, targeting disease cells and renewing your, your cells and uh, um, having favorable changes in your blood sugar, cholesterol, uh, of course, for, for weight loss, it can be helpful. And then definitely there's a, <clears throat> a big cognitive component, which is why the, I think it's a component of the program um, with uh, cognitive decline is that, um, it um, affects um, um, you know, components like brain-derived neurotrophic factor and um, other um, brain nutrients uh, mm -hmm. and in a positive way. And so um, intermittent fasting can have you know, huge effects for you know, all of those different aspects of health. And the next one is Five Secrets of Optimal Exercise. And there you talk about the benefits of erratic exercise. Eccentric. Eccentric, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I thought I had it right, but that's, it's the 72-year-old brain. <laughs> so eccentric exercise. So say a little about your, your perspective on exercise and also uh, the difference between, you know, just regular aerobics or regular running. There are certain forms of exercise that have high efficiency in effect. Right. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, so regarding exercise, I think uh, the um, coming from the perspective of the paleo um, point of view, you know, what did our ancestors used to do? You know, um, were they, um, you know, going to the gym or, you know, swimming, swimming laps or, you know, no. no. Um, they were, um, I mean, exercise and movement was survival. I mean, they, it was just life. You know, you either... Um, you know, moved or you died, you know. And uh, um, so basically, um, a lot of times, hunter-gatherers, if you look at their movement patterns, uh, long periods of um, slow, you know, uh, regular movement, like walking or gathering, uh, punctuated by short movements of very rapid activity mm -hmm. when you're chasing an animal or escaping from a predator. And so uh, there's a type of uh, exercise known as um, high-intensity interval training, mm -hmm. which um, tries to sort of replicate that movement pattern. And, um, and that's um, an approach which studies have shown is um, actually superior to the traditional cardio, you know, just um, go on a treadmill or something like that, um, in terms of its effects on, um, um, you know, endurance, strength building, um, even weight loss. So there's a lot of favorable data on high intensity interval training. Um, so that's, you know, one thing I, I talk about how to, you know, incorporate that. And then what you refer to in terms of the eccentric exercise. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't mean um, uh, a totally bizarre workout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, but very simply, um, from exercise physiology, um, there's the concentric and the eccentric uh, phases of a muscle contraction. Mm -hmm. So if you were doing a... Um, um, a bicep curl. The simple example is the when you lift up the the barbell, that's the concentric phase, and when you're extending it, that's the eccentric phase. Mm -hmm. And studies have shown that actually, um, for building strength, the the eccentric phase may be more important, at least equally important, but perhaps more important than the concentric phase. So um, the military has studied this a lot in terms of you know fitness, and. Uh, um, so they, so that's why I think emphasizing the eccentric phase when the um, muscle is still contracting but lengthening, you know, that's very important for strength training. And I do think strength training is is very important for everybody, regardless of age, um, just because of so many benefits for um, not just for you know the physical body, but hormones and um, you know um, other uh, other uh, mental benefits as well. So. Um, so those are some of the ways to apply the paleo principles to exercise. Mm -hmm. Your next chapter is on sleep. And there was something there that, I mean, you have a lot of good suggestions on how to improve sleep. But I don't remember you talking about the two sleeps theory, which is, you know, that, mm. that, that in traditional societies very often people didn't sleep eight mm -hmm. hours straight, that they slept for four or five hours. 
woke up for a while and went back to sleep. Mm -hmm. Am I correct that you didn't discuss that? No. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I was curious about that because it, for me and for many other people, uh, waking up in the middle of the night, not only is it natural, mm -hmm. but it's actually a very precious period of time. Right. And in contemplative traditions, very often that's a period when people meditate or it's just mm -hmm. special time. Mm -hmm. Have you reflected on that and is that part of what you talk to patients about? Um, yes, I think, uh, and you know, I, there is also some interesting research right. about that when they've looked at right. uh, traditional societies. So, yeah, um, I didn't focus on it in the book just because mm -hmm. of space restrictions. Space, yeah. But when I do um, talk with patients, I um, I always uh, um, ask them whether because the so many of them, you are right, do mm -hmm. have that um, that experience. But for some of them, it's it's actually very disturbing. Um, mm -hmm. and um, they would much rather just sleep through the night. Right, exactly. And, uh, but I think that's you know, partly because yeah. we believe we should. Right. No, and that true. if we wake that's in true. the middle of the night, there's somehow something wrong with us, we need to take a pill, this, that, and the other. Right, right. Whereas yes. if we thought, hey, this is just part of the natural human pattern of sleep, right. we might right. rejoice in getting up in the middle of the night for a while. Yes, you know? yeah. yeah. So for some people, I do agree that I think uh, um, it's a matter of reframing right. the perspective about sleep and right. what is optimal sleep. You know, optimal sleep is enough sleep so that you feel rested in the morning. Yeah. You know, when you wake yeah. up, and yeah. that's completely different for yeah. everybody. Yeah. And for some people, that might involve wait, you know, waking yeah. up during the night. Yeah. And uh, but I, I also look at um, you know what's been their pattern during their whole life. So were they someone who was always kind of a night owl and yeah. would wake up during the night and you know never change that pattern, or were they someone who always used to sleep through the night and then in the last year suddenly they're waking up and mm -hmm. something's different. So. In that case, maybe we should look at you know why this changed. Mm -hmm. But I, I do agree that I think there's um, kind of an over medicalizing of, of the sleep issues, mm -hmm. and uh, um, it can certainly be healthy to have a period when you're waking up and reflecting and go back to sleep and mm -hmm. you know and, and feel rested in the morning. Mm -hmm. Your last uh, chapter in part two uh, and uh, is on uh, the mind controls the body, stress reduction, and spirituality. Um, I'm always interested in the uses people make of the term spirituality because in, in my experience, I mean, there are religious people, there are spiritual people, there are philosophical people, there are simply secular people, mm -hmm. people who find meaning in nature but, you know, don't consider themselves spiritual. And so, at least my own approach is not to privilege spirituality over the other approaches. Mm -hmm. That, from my experience, people who consider themselves, quote, spiritual are in no way um, superior to or mm -hmm. kinder than or wiser than mm -hmm. people who take other approaches. Right. So I'm just curious because you've thought about these things. Mm -hmm. um, why call it spirituality? Rachel Remen, for example, talks about finding meaning, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, why have you chosen spirituality as a language for talking about the numerous different ways people mm -hmm find numinousness or coherence or meaning. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, I think um, that's those are very um, important distinctions mm -hmm. that, that you make. Uh, and uh, I think that um, for me, um, just choosing the word spirituality was to help people separate that from religion mm -hmm. because um, yeah, yeah, for so sure. that yeah really the main yeah. purpose because mm -hmm. so many of my patients when I try to talk them talk to them about meaning or you know the what gives them a sense of direction in their life um, they bring it right to religion and say oh I was raised Catholic and you know mm -hmm. I'm not religious anymore yeah, yeah. and right. that's the end of the conversation right. but I'm trying to um, get people to see that there is something distinct from religion um, and spirituality could be um, uh, something that gives you meaning which may come from nature, it may come mm -hmm. from your family, it may come from your goals in life and, you know, and just to open the conversation. And I agree, there's no real um, perfect word to capture all of that. Right. Um, but it's mainly um, to help people realize that there's a distinction between religion and meaning yeah. and spirituality. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well, before we go to th part three, I want to turn this back over to Rebecca because she has two pages of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also just to give you a break from hearing my voice. <laughs> um, wow. Um, I, I know what I want to talk about. Well, first of all, uh, I'm 
I'm so thrilled about your coverage of the the Kitchen RX and the mm. role of of herbs and spices because mm. I they're they're plants. I mean, they, well, they count yeah. in a plant based mm-hmm. diet, right? Right. Um, but the other thing that I thought might be interesting for people to hear a little bit more about in the mm. Ayurvedic tradition is the role of the six taste mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and. Um, because I'm always, as a cook, yes. searching for yum. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the six tastes do, um, the, there's, there's, there's a lot to those six tastes mm-hmm. and how um, we balance our plate. Mm-hmm. So can you talk about the six tastes? Yeah. And we can maybe talk a little bit about how, we, how that really makes people want to gravitate to the plate versus Mm -hmm. not gravitate to the plate. Yes. Yeah, that's um, actually one of my favorite topics, Rebecca. So so in Ayurveda, the six tastes are um, sweet, sour, salty, and then um, bitter, pungent, and astringent. So the um, three tastes that we have way too much of in our society are the first three, which are the sweet, sour, and salty. And we have um, nowhere near enough of the latter three, the bitter, pungent, and the astringent. And the reasoning behind Ayurveda um, emphasis on the six tastes is that uh, each taste has a different effect on the doshas. So um, uh, when you're eating a balance of all six tastes, you're actually having a harmonizing effect on the doshas because certain tastes might raise vata or lower pitta and you know vice versa for different tastes. So um, so the bitter, pungent, and astringent are the tastes that are really missing, you know, in our um, food, and that's uh, what I think we need to get more of. And when I look at it from the biochemical point of view, the compounds responsible for those tastes are, um, you know, often the phytochemicals or nutrients that are missing in other foods. You know, um, so for example, with um, let's take uh, well, start with pungent. So pungent basically is, refer, is a spice, the spicy taste. So all spices will give you that, that pungent taste. Um, and uh, so just incorporating more spices automatically will give you, you know, that, that aspect. Um, bitter, so um, when you have, um, you know, most leafy greens are considered bitter. And, you know, I, th- I would say all of us could benefit from having more leafy greens. Right. But also there's certain um, vegetables, for example, um, bitter gourd, in, in Ayurveda is considered a medicine for, um, for diabetes um, and for you know, metabolic issues. Um, bitter melon you know, is another, it's very common in, in Asia. And um, so a lot of those, um, like in India, there's um, um, ma- many people who have a bitter taste every day. You know, bitter gourd is one of the most popular vegetables in, in, in India, even though it's very bitter. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, so I think part of it is also retraining our palate to, you know, to, um, to, to see the, the complexity of, of taste. Because uh, when you eat bitter gourd, it's nothing like you, you, you've eaten. You know, it's, uh, it's not just bitter, but there's also a sweetness. There's also a sour. There's also pungent, you know. And um, so I think um, part of it is just expanding our palate and expanding our idea of, of taste. And then lastly, astringent. Um, so that's basically anything where um, when you're, Eating it, it makes you feel like you're, you have to pucker your, your lips or there's a drying quality. So, um, so tea has an astringent quality um, because of the tannins you know, in tea. Um, pomegranate has an astringent quality. Cranberry does as well. Um, rhubarb has an astringency. So there are all these foods which... Um, chocolate, yes. <laughs> yes. So if you have... Um, you know, cacao um, that's not sweetened, that does have an astringent quality to it. And uh, I think the problem is when it's just overloaded with sugar and you completely miss that, that taste. But um, the astringent taste as well is, um, um, you know, very helpful for um, reducing pitta, which is the, the fire dosha. So Ayurveda would, would say that, you know, as a society, we probably have very high pitta, you know, very high inflammation that's correlated with pitta. Uh, very high stress, um, uh, emphasis on overachieving, on uh, accomplishment, you know. So uh, how do you counteract that, that high pitta? Well, um, you know, meditation is one of the best ways, um, but 
the astringent taste uh, is very cooling for the body and that counteracts the pitta. So incorporating um, all those foods, you know, the bitter taste is very cooling and counteracts pitta. So those are the, as a society, we're missing the foods that could rebalance us, you know? And so I think that's where um, Ayurveda could help um, using that idea of the tastes to help bring those foods back in. And also um, uh, the sweet, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you are you do such a wonderful job about talking about the 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 role of sweet mm -hmm. um because it is one of the tastes but yes. what's the what's the proper way to incorporate sweet mm -hmm. um and it, not in just loading yourself up with um refined carbohydrates and cakes and cookies and that type of thing yes but foods like figs and and dates mm -hmm or even sweet potatoes mm -hmm. with cinnamon could, could really, it plays that role. The, right. the root vegetables certainly mm -hmm. play that role. Yes. Especially absolutely. for uh, Avada. Yes, yes. <laughs> I need to have yeah. root vegetables like right here, like little ankle bracelets to keep me <laughs> grounded. Yeah, and you know, with sweet, what's interesting is that Ayurveda, um, of course, includes those um, you know sweet foods uh, in, in that category, but also there's other foods which you wouldn't think of as sweet that have a, a sweet taste to them. So um, most um, um, whole grains are considered to have a sweet taste, and um, ghee or clarified butter is considered to <sighs> have oil, a sweet oil. taste. Yes, yes. <laughs> so. Um, so in terms of the effect on the body, so the, it's, um, there's so many, yeah, there's so many different ways to incorporate that sweet taste, which is important. You have to have all six tastes. You have to have salt, you have to have sweet, you have to have sour. It's just a matter of the balance with all the other tastes. It's, it's culinary out, culinary and, and medical alchemy at its best, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it's really the true food is medicine. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to go to the third part on detoxify, detoxify to reach the next level of health. This is a quite unique, I won't say unique, but a rare emphasis in mm -hmm. contemporary nutrition. If you look at the field, Andrew Weil is one of the few people who've taken toxins seriously. Mm -hmm. um, but you go uh, even further into a really detailed discussion. Part of our work here at Commonweal mm -hmm. for the last... Uh, 40 years actually, is looking at the impact of toxic chemicals on our health, which mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, profound. And so you really talk about uh, detoxification and um, you take it very seriously and it's an important contribution. So what are, what is the heart of your approach to detoxification? Yeah, I um, completely agree with you, Michael. I yeah. think that's a hugely important topic, yeah. and um, uh, and I think um, you know you know as much about it as I do. Um, and but I think that you know what I see with my patients is the effect of of toxins yeah. and uh, and the benefit that comes from detoxification yeah. based on how they're feeling. And that's why I've made it you know one of the three uh, pillars in my book. And um, so I think the. The, there's really just two very simple um, approaches. One is reducing your intake of toxins and then increasing the um, clearance of toxins. And so I talk about both of those aspects um, and uh, um, how to reduce the toxic exposure from daily you know, living. And then in terms of clearance of toxins, I talk about um, foods that are helpful. Um, so for example, um, beets and beetroot is, uh, um, has been shown to help with, you know, your liver function and uh, especially the greens or the leafy tops of the beets are very um, helpful for, you know, supporting um, a process known as methylation, which is how the body, one of the ways the body um, clears toxins. And um, um, so beets are one of the superfoods that I talk about and um, a, the beet greens are something which I really emphasize a lot. Um, all the cruciferous vegetables uh, like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, all of those help with supporting liver function. So I try to really um, emphasize foods uh, for detoxification. And then in Ayurveda, there's a very strong emphasis on, um, on certain practices um, such as um, sweating to, to detoxify. But you, on and, sweating, uh, yeah. you note that uh, saunas actually have a higher 
the kind of sweating you do in saunas actually has a higher clearance rate than the sweating from exercise, if I remember correctly. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And that if you can't do a conventional <laughs> sauna, you're convinced of the safety of the infrared sauna? Um, I believe so, yeah. I think like anything, you know, it has to be um, caref used carefully yeah. and thoughtfully, but yeah. yes. Um, and yeah, so with, with sweating, I think when the body is heated from an external source, yeah. um, what's cleared is different than when the, when the body's heated right. internally, like from exercise. Right. And you know, both are, are helpful, but um, for toxins specifically, I think the external heating is more effective. Right, and, uh, yeah. I want to go to our colleague Cynthia Lee, the functional medicine physician who's with us today. Cynthia, you've read the book and thought about this. Do you have a thought or comment on it? Um, I mean, what I mostly appreciated was how seamlessly you move between the art, right, of Ayurveda. I know there's a lot of tradition and science in it, too, but it's really an art form and then the science. And it's all, I mean, it's kind of seamless. Um, and so for you to pull that off, I thought was really, um, it was very skilled. Um, oh, thank you. Craft. <laughs> Um, but that's also what I find that we're doing in medicine now is really right personalizing things so it's an art. Mm -hmm. and there's the science. And I guess what I what I struggle with in my practice is um, I don't have patients coming to me who are on paleo. Mm -hmm. so, some of them do. You know, they, they've gone on the internet or they've looked at other resources and they've tried to clean up their diet and they're still struggling. But most of them come to me um, really looking for diagnostics, really looking for a protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to, you know, my time, they don't want me to, like, talk for now about food, right? Mm -hmm. They want me to look at high-tech sort of information that they can then, um, that I can help them come up with a plan mm -hmm. um, to help them feel better. A lot of them are so unwell, they can't make any changes in their diet. They can't exercise. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh that's kind of where I feel a little bit, you know, kind of up against a, mm -hmm. um, a ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, you know, I read, actually, I read most of this book um, a few weeks ago. And what I found helpful was, you know, I've known, I've had patients who try elimination diets or paleo kinds of elimination diets, and they mm -hmm. don't do well, particularly the thin high metabolic, right? Mm -hmm. They're breaking down their tissues and mm -hmm. they're in a really high inflammatory, right, fire kind of state. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell them, be sure to eat enough carbohydrates. Like, you're going to just wither away, mm -hmm. right? right. Mm -hmm. So, but with your different body types, I've been able to really be more specific. Mm -hmm. And so I had, like, a couple of patients, I would say, you know, I'd look at them and I'd say, okay, well, you know, your body doesn't do very well on a vegetarian diet. And, you know, salads, they probably don't even nourish you at all. Mm -hmm. And they look at you like, how did you know? <laughs> you know? And so, as, and I said, well, there's just certain kinds of constitutions. Oh, my God. You know, you need heavy meats and stews. And mm -hmm. if you want to do vegetables, root vegetables. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's been helpful in that sense because then they actually understand that there is a personalized way mm -hmm. rather than just kind of, you know, you're out there. So, um, but yeah, as much as we think functional medicine is all science and biomarkers and things, it's really an art form. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think, I mean, just to speak to that testing, I think that's the reason why, mm -hmm. you know, when patients can afford it, we just try to test as much as we can. We're trying to get a sense of what works and what right. doesn't what's helpful and what's not. And we just, the information hasn't been around long enough for us to know that. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that, you know, over the next, you know, five to 10 years, that there's going to be a real streamlining mm -hmm. of even diagnostic tests. Yes. Personalized yeah. mm -hmm. testing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And I can definitely relate to um, what you said about the, the patients who are just too sick to change their diet or, you know, start exercising because uh, um, I think... Uh, you, you know, I, I have many of those patients as well. And you, you have to really, sometimes you have to start with the most high tech things, the testing and really get them stable enough so they can even think about cooking or, you know, exercise. And um, you have to kind of meet them where they are. And, you know, not everybody is in a place where um, diet and nutrition are the, the, the highest yield areas, you know. Or, so I, 
I definitely agree that I think um, um, for some people it's a completely different area where it's the, you get the maximum impact you know, for, your, for your time. And uh, um, so it's, it's not diet for everybody. Mm. So I can relate to that. You know, can I, can I go ahead. Yeah, please. Also yeah. Just about the body types, because that, that was the part I found most helpful, but also most unique, yes. you know, about your book. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, and you say that a lot of people are different, right? They're kind of a different, they're different compositions of different types. Yes. But I do see a lot of people who are uh, very, and I think I emailed you about this, mm-hmm. um, very high vata. So they're wind, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're just anxious, they're, you know, spending lots of energy, they're thin, they can't put on weight, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But then they're also clearly inflamed. They're very right. inflamed. Mm-hmm. So they're really yes. vatas, or pitta as well. Yeah. Um, and like, I guess you're much more nuanced with this. How do you approach that? How do you counsel on you know, diet? Well, there's um, two aspects to the body types. So there's the, what's called the prakriti, which is your constitution. Uh, which is what is determined at conception, and that never changes. So if you are um, 50% vata, you know, 20% pitta, 30% kapha from birth, that um, body type will never change. But the current state of your dosha is called vikruti, uh, is always changing every day. And the most common imbalances um, as well that I see are, the, you know, too much vata, uh, which is uh, the main thing that throws off vata is stress. And, you know, who here doesn't have a lot of stress in our lives? And then um, pitta is correlated with inflammation, which is also um, the root of most uh, chronic diseases, you know, excessive chronic inflammation. So it's actually possible to have um, an excess of all three doshas. So somebody with a certain body type, even if they're vata, they might have too much vata, too much pitta, and too much kapha at the same time. So that's their vikruti or their current state, which is different from their prakriti. So while the body type never changes, their current state is always changing. And you have to figure out um, which is the most out of balance, you know, which is the priority dosha, and then start treating that. And then once you quiet that one, then you go to the second one that's out of balance, and you know, sometimes then the third one. So it's a matter of you know, prioritizing but you definitely um, can see multiple doshas out of balance at the same time. That's, that's you know, especially in people who are seriously ill, that's quite common. Um. You know, if you go to an Institute of Functional Medicine annual conference, which I did, mm-hmm. uh, where you see, I don't know what, 500, 700 uh, participants, mm-hmm. and they are primarily young physicians, naturopaths, you know, fa- you know uh, 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 family practitioners of various kinds. But their commonality is that most of them had health problems themselves that conventional medicine couldn't deal with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they had to go on the journey that you went on um, and that Cynthia went on and most functional medicine practitioners have been on, Mm -hmm. uh, and that you went on, you know, so, uh, Rebecca. So, uh, uh, we go on these journeys not out of theoretical interest, Mm -hmm. but because we have to. Right, right. And so, one thing I want to bring up here is because it's, you know, the way we're talking about it, it's sort of interesting that there are all these things. But the truth of the matter is that when most people really encounter it in the kinds of crises that your patients come to you in it, these are not hypothetical questions. So, right. for example, with Dean Ornish's work, you mm-hmm. know, he's the guy who did the randomized controlled trials demonstrating that people with coronary artery disease mm-hmm. could actually reverse the coronary artery disease compared to the control group, right? right? Mm-hmm. Now, Mark Hyman's in a big fight with him about whether there was actually, actually higher mortality in, in his group than, uh, than in the control group. Mm-hmm. So you could get complex about that. But then he also did the studies with prostate cancer showing mm-hmm. that if the Gleason index wasn't too high, that the PSA counts actually dropped and some of the cancers stabilized and they didn't need on a wait and watch program. You mm-hmm. know. And he's asked the question, well, if this is true of heart disease and prostate cancer, what other conditions is it true of? So, you know, while his position is 
flexible. He talks about a spectrum diet, mm -hmm. but he comes from a primarily vegetarian perspective, right? right? Mm -hmm. So that is really a quite dramatic contrast with the paleo, you mm -hmm. know? So the question is, when, uh, uh, when you have a cancer patient or mm -hmm. a heart patient or, you know, somebody with a serious illness, and they are out there, perhaps they've done some research, and they, honest to God, can't figure out right, right. whether they should follow an orange type program or a paleo program. Mm -hmm. If they're sitting in your office with that information, what do you say to them? Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's a great question. Um, so I think the um, the Ornish program is a good program mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, really works. It's There's research that backs it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is this tension. Many people in the paleo community don't like his work because, mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't like the emphasis on cutting out meat and right, you know, exactly. very low fat yeah, yeah. diet, but it does work. And yeah. I think, but it works for some people. Uh, right. And I think one you know good thing about it is it cuts out um, you know so much so many people talk about what it includes right. but I think it's very important to talk about what it cuts out right. you know it cuts out refined um, carbohydrates right. um, all flour right. um, all sugar right. um, so you know those are um, those are really big things to cut out mm -hmm. you know no matter what you're eating <laughs> and um, I think that's very powerful to eliminate you know, in, in those things and then. To answer your question about um, uh, you know the individual patient when they're in the room, mm -hmm. so from um, the perspective of Ayurveda, again, it has to be um, customized. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, ten people with heart disease might get ten different recommendations. Mm -hmm. You know, depending on their body type, depending on their you know mm -hmm. comorbidities, depending mm -hmm. on their um, doshas, and so uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, easy answer mm -hmm. to this question because. Uh, um, it really depends on, um, you know, what their doshas are like. So, for example, uh, if somebody is a very high pitta, um, traditionally, stereotypically, you know, pitta, like you, you do the questionnaire in the book and it's very clear, then um, that person might actually do really well on the Ornish program mm -hmm. because uh, traditionally um, pitta people do not, uh, can do well without animal protein and um, necessarily may not need the same levels of protein in general as a vata person. So a high um, person might be a type A personality, right? Yeah. And so yes, many of Ornish's yes. right. patients they are type A men. Right, you know, right. With heart disease. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so those people would do really well right. on, a, on a, that right. program. But if somebody has a lot of vata where they're, right. um, you know... High strung. Yeah, high strung, very underweight, right. um, and, you know, always um, struggling to maintain weight, right. which is a problem for a lot of my right. patients, right. then, you know, they may not do so well on a low-fat vegetarian diet mm -hmm. where, um, you know, with, no, with absolutely, absolutely no fat. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think... Uh, it again comes back to that looking at individuality and um, mm -hmm. and customizing it, and you know in the book I've, I've really oversimplified Ayurveda. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a about a lot more than just three body types, mm -hmm. um, yes. and uh, you know in five thousand years they figured out a few more things <laughs> <laughs> than that. But what I wanted to do was make it accessible, you yeah. know, as a as an entry point for yeah. people to start learning about. Yeah. Um, but once somebody has heart disease mm -hmm. uh, or cancer or a major condition um, is quite complex mm -hmm. to treat them, you know, using an Ayurvedic perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the best way is probably to work with a practitioner who can really check their pulses, look at their tongue, you know, get their history and come up with the, the most uh, individualized recommendation. Mm -hmm. Nicolette Han Nyman, as a uh, proponent of organic grass-fed beef, the author of Righteous Pork Chop and In Defense of Beef. You've been listening to this. I knew you were eager to come today. What are your reflections on what you've heard? Well, um, first of all, it's like the most interesting and sensible conversation I've heard about food and health, maybe ever. <laughs> yes. 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 I'm so glad I came. So, and I, and I have, your book has been recommended to me, and I haven't read it just because I have a pile of books this high mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be reading, but I'm definitely going to read your book because it sounds so fascinating. But I had a thought as I was listening, that wasn't touched on, which is sort of this notion of um, that the animals in our food system need as well, that their natures need to be respected um, mm -hmm. in terms of their lives being the way their lives are supposed to be and their diets being what their diets should be in order mm -hmm. to produce healthy food. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to sort of bring that into the conversation, see if you had any comment on that. 
Yes. Um, well, um, yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think um, the work that you're doing is, is really amazing. Uh, so thanks for all that you're doing. And uh, yeah, so I think that, um, um, you know, I think, was it Michael Pollan who said that you, you are what, what you eat eats? And uh, <laughs> so, so it's absolutely critical, you know, in terms of um, with animals, what they're eating. Um, are they eating a traditional diet? You know, and there's a lot of politics around that, as, as you know. Um, so um, I was at a conference, of, like a, a paleo conference, where uh, I heard that uh, um, uh, in Iowa, one of the top animal researchers in Iowa actually made the statement that the, um, the natural diet of a cow is grass. And I think he lost his job for that. <laughs> because, you know, uh, Iowa is where the corn industry is, uh, is so popular. And, uh, you know, um, there, that's, um, even though that might seem like a logical statement that, you know, probably cows do eat grass typically. Um, but the, um, because so much of our animals and cows are fed grain, you know, that statement was um, very controversial. And uh, so I think that... Um, Absolutely, you know, I'm in favor of, if you are eating meat, getting high quality grass-fed meat. And uh, um, I think the labeling around meat is also very confusing, you know, because there's, uh, um, there's what's called all natural, which doesn't mean anything at all. Um, and, uh, you know, there's organic or grass-fed and um, sometimes grass-fed, but not grass-finished. And so I, um, so I try to also in the book talk about the different labels for people to just be better consumers of, um, you know, choosing the, the highest quality meat. But, uh, but I definitely agree with you that I think that's a very important point to, to mention. And, and I just want to say, just, just beyond the diet of the animal, too, I think yeah. the animal's experience, the life mm -hmm. experience, is a, it's right. a little bit intangible, but I think that that's a really important mm -hmm. part of the question of healthful mm -hmm. food systems and healthful eating. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I completely yeah. agree with yes. that. Yeah. I think it's deeply important. Anna O'Malley is our uh, beloved uh, integrative medicine physician and Bolinas and a partner in many ventures. Um, as you've listened to Akhil, what are your reflections from your practice? Well, I, I think that Akhil's book is a beautiful synthesis of a lot of, of what we in integrative medicine are really striving to, to bring into the conversation, into the room. Mm -hmm. That you know, there, there are many ways to achieve healing and, and that um, having, having, living a lifestyle that, that is deeply meaningful and medicinal is, you know, there, there are many layers to that. Mm -hmm. and, I also deeply appreciate that nuanced, individualized approach that Ayurveda brings and the way you, you bring it into the, the book is, is beautiful. Uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in right now is how, how do we function within the ecology of our village, within our natural world, within on this you know, precious planet that we are inhabiting. And so I, I really was very interested in some of the, the things that you brought forth with, you know, connection to you know, more of our natural state. What's, what, what have we, what can we learn by looking to our ancestors and by connecting with, um, you know, the wild plants? And, and mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a really interesting place to explore. And I appreciated your bringing it forth. So mm -hmm. I thought it was beautiful and, and really and just thrilled for you. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ned Hoke is a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner who comes again from one of the great traditions like Ayurveda, going back an equal number of thousands of years. And uh, you've reflected on these things a lot. What came to you as you listened to Akhil? <clears throat> well, I looked at the book prior to our visit in this room today, and my, right away what came to mind to me was how beautifully user-friendly what this gentleman had written. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the, the, the actualization of the teaching of Chinese medicine, which again is a very similar kind of uh, humoral system, so-called, mm -hmm. and um, the, the, the making that useful to the client in a, in a way that your Ayurvedic does, at least in terms of the, the, the brief that I saw of that book, I mean, a lot of times we're not, at least of the Chinese world that I'm part of, which is I'm pretty much a functional medicine doctor these days, more than a Chinese doctor, so I'm, I don't really speak very well with the Chinese area, although it's certainly it's my license and so on. Um, a lot of what we do is, is 
<clears throat> is not very efficient in terms of um, uh, teachings that are not as sort of user-friendly as what this book offers. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what's available out there in, in uh, Chinese medicine land really is sort of modern, kind of mixed over kind of things, which doesn't really have the tradition, the, 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 the depth of, of the tradition of like, which is obvious as you pick up this book, you can see that there's still a lineage of tradition that is at least, again, very cursory lands. It, it, it just feels that, like it has the tradition alive. And people like me are sort of bastards, really. And we're just doing a little of this and a little of that. Mm -hmm. And so I really honor the fact that this that ma that maintains yeah. the, 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 the deep root of things, yeah. that, which reminds me, just to forgive me for going on, but I remember when I was at the at, at NIH, there was the first national meeting on Chinese medicine at, at uh, mm -hmm. uh, the description of what where did this belong in the United States. And the interesting thing is the people who stood up and talked about it in the most effective way, I thought, were the people who said, you know, what we're losing is we're, we're turning this into some kind of hyper-modern thing with some kind of hospital applications, when in fact really what Chinese medicine is, that was our conversation, is this deep understanding of, of fundamental physiology in terms of the life forces of the universe as well as the body, and that the business of embracing all of those things and, and not just rushing off to some kind of clinical, whether it's functional medicine thing or some, some number on a chart somewhere, but the, the idea really the, 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 the positive life force that we, that we have opportunity to be part of and the business of steering us into that positive life force. A lot of times we're in Chinese medicine, they were saying we were losing that. And so I, I think that what I hear this gentleman is doing is not doing that. Mm. It's a beautiful comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, um, if I could speak to that, I think um, um, that's a really good point because, uh, um, you know, in Ayurveda as well, there's so much of this fundamental emphasis about, you know, being in right relationship with life. And that's a really fundamental part of health is just uh, being in right relationship to the universe, you know, and um, like to Anna, as Anna was saying, to the planet as a whole. And um, so the deepest definitions of health in Ayurveda have nothing to do with the body, you know, but, but really with um, this relationship to the whole, you know, to the, the society, to, the, to your family, to the, the planet, um, to the universe, uh, and also to your purpose, you know, to whatever your purpose is for being on earth. And um, so I think that that's an aspect of Ayurveda which, you know, is um, hard to convey in, you know, a few hundred words or a few hundred pages. <laughs> and um, um, so that's always a, um, a concern for me because as I talk about Ayurveda, I don't want people to realize, to miss all these other components to it. That, um, so I'm glad that that came through in some way, that there is really a depth and a subtlety to the, 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 this lineage. And, uh, and it really is like an ocean of knowledge. And, you know, I've maybe tasted like a few drops and written a book, but <laughs> there's so much more to it than what I, you know, I can speak to in, in a short time. But I think that um, at its deepest levels, Ayurveda is not about the body, you know. Just like yoga, at its deepest level, it's not about the physical body, but it's really about about the universe as a whole and being at one with the universe, being in the right relationship with life as a whole, which encompasses everything. And so I think um, that's really the essence of Ayurveda to me. Mm. Beautiful. Claire Hart, as the master of the Commonweal Kitchen and uh, someone who does exquisite uh, food. Uh, preparation for untold numbers of people. As you listen to this, what, what comes to you? I want the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll, you can get it in a few minutes. Thank you. So let me open it up for any other comments or questions, if you'd keep them brief so we can hear from a few people. Yes. Well, I was so glad um, Ned said that your book is user-friendly because I've had some experience with Ayurveda. Like right. in Goa in around right. 2003, I went to the Ayurveda Institute. Great. And, and then the next year, I went to another Ayurvedic practitioner, and both of them gave me different constitutional <laughs> diagnoses. So mm -hmm. they, were, they weren't the same. And I feel mm -hmm. like I've always been kind of confused how you can do self-practice with Ayurveda without going to an expert who tells you what you are. And then I went to two experts and they told me different things. So I'm wondering if you could recommend some basic tests 
um, that are part of functional medicine that could be a, a nice grounding for us in addition to uh, be anxious to see how user friendly your book is because I find it Ayurveda kind of dizzying and mm. off putting and intimidating as, in terms of self help mm-hmm. without expert. Um, do, you, um, do you mean test functional medicine tests that could tell you about Ayurveda? No, or? Just, no just a test that everybody should have. Like most people, <laughs> many people or half people are insulin resistant and don't oh, know I it. See. Okay. And okay. the right tests aren't being recommended from what I've been reading from Dr. Mm-hmm. Mike Hyman and others. And, Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, um, the um, areas which are important, uh, a lot of them can be tested um, through regular labs. So I don't think everybody needs a functional medicine, you know, doctor. Um, but um, I, yeah, one area which you mentioned, which is blood sugar regulation, you know, that's really fundamental. And um, I think um, um, having an insulin level checked is one basic thing that, you know, uh, people can do because uh, Many years before blood sugar gets elevated, insulin gets out of balance. So if you can prevent a case of diabetes, I mean, that's um, hugely um, important. And uh, so I think um, um, working with the conventional doctor to get some good blood sugar testing, and then... Does it have to be the two-hour test? Not necessarily, no. I think a a fasting insulin level, you know, in addition to a fasting blood sugar, are actually adequate. uh, That gives you a lot of information right there in terms of what your levels are. And then um, when you do a a basic cholesterol panel, which all of us have had, if you look at the ratio between the um, triglycerides and the HDL, um, that's um, a ratio that actually tells you quite a bit about inflammation in the body. And typically people look at the ratio between your good and the bad cholesterol. So the, you know, the HDL to the LDL or the total cholesterol to the LDL. Maybe I'm getting too technical here. But, um, you know, I think a simple test that everybody can do with a fasting cholesterol panel is look at the ratio between um, triglycerides to HDL. And um, for men, that ratio should be below three. And for women, um, should be below 2.5 ideally. So that's just a, a simple rough measure to, to start. Uh, Other comments? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a chief alumni, and I bought your book on the way in. Um, I live with stage four breast cancer. Okay. I'm on a trial drug. I have challenges. There's, I have no appetite mm-hmm. and not a lot of taste. And um, so food is a big issue, and I'm hoping from listening to you that I will find a path, maybe bone broth, to, um, to keep my weight up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also have mouth challenges from the drugs. Mm-hmm. So um, so your, your words are very reassuring, mm-hmm. and I've enjoyed Claire's <laughs> cooking, mm-hmm. and all the support of this community. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you so much for being here. Yes. Hi, my question is about the wild uh, versions of the fruits and vegetables. I have not heard of that, and how would I know? Mm-hmm. Uh, how yeah. Is, yeah, what yeah. so um, there are some basic rules. Um, so like, for example, um, the um, more uh, intensely colored uh, a plant or, or, um, is, the more phytochemicals it contains. So that's the basis behind the idea of eating the rainbow, you know, eating mm-hmm. all the different colors. Every color is a different phytochemical. So just getting the brightest, uh, most intensely colored, you know, plants. That's a good rule. Second rule is um, uh, with any fruit or vegetable, um, th- most of the antioxidants are either on the skin or just below the skin because the antioxidants are how a plant defends itself. So, uh, you know, plants are living and uh, they have to defend themselves against, uh, you know, pests, insects, sunlight, and, you know, et cetera. And so, the antioxidants are on the surface because that's where the stress is for plants. So, for example, with, um, with oranges, the, um, the, the pith or the white part just below the peel is actually the most nutritious part, the orange. Okay. Um, with apples, it's the peel and, uh, you know, they're just below the peel. With avocados, if you look at the, when you peel the avocado, 
just below, um, beneath the skin, there's a more um, um, dark green area, which is like darker than the rest of the avocado. So that's because there's more antioxidants right below the skin. Um, so, um, so like that, yeah, I mean, I have a whole chapter about this, um, but um, those are some general rules that can be helpful. And uh, um, all these little things, I think, make a difference, you know, when they add up. Um, I want to give Rebecca Katz an opportunity to uh, either ask a final comment or uh, make a final observation about this. Wow, the pressure's on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, again, I'm just going to circle back and say that at the end of the day, you know, um, this creating this healthy connection to food mm -hmm. and honoring that that alchemy of of the art mm -hmm. it really is that art of of kind of the self-awareness of who we are at any one time and what our relationship is with our food and mm -hmm. how the power of food can be so incredibly healing and nurturing mm -hmm. um, and I just so appreciate that with all the dense nutrition in here, I mean, this truly is just chock full of, I mean, you just don't need another nutrition book. Mm -hmm. You've laid it out so beautifully, but I really feel that you have wrapped it around um, really why the, the, going back to tradition, back to our ancestors, um, and you're, you're, pointing us, you're, you're giving us our true north, our culinary GPS in this book. I'm so appreciative. Oh, Thank well. you. <laughs> well, um, I must say, I mean, um, I think you do the same, Rebecca, and uh, um, it's uh, really appreciate your, your kind words. And, uh, um, and Michael, thank you for having me here. And um, you know, and thanks to, to all of you for, for being a part of this, uh, this evening. So, uh, Akil, I have one final question for you. You, you spoke of the importance of purpose in life. Mm -hmm. Can you describe to us what your sense of your purpose in being here is? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, I think it's um, there's many levels to that. Um, I think. Uh, Within medicine, um, my goal is just to change medicine, and uh, hopefully, <laughs> um, and, uh, um, in whatever small way that I can, you know, because uh, I <laughs> because I think um, medicine is very slow to change, and um, but on the other hand, there's so many. Um, physicians who are open to change now, you know, like we see in the room here, and uh, and I think education is a big part of that. So I think, uh, um, you know, um, just teaching, helping doctors learn about nutrition, which we never learned in medical school. Uh, I think we had like three hours in medical school uh, on nutrition. Um, and then I think um, also um, empowering people to take control of their health and and really take health back into their own hands. Mm -hmm. Because I think there is um, kind of this old model of the top-down approach for healthcare that, you know, whether it's you see the, you know, the doctor who knows everything or the Ayurvedic expert who tells you, you know, this is what you do. There is, I think, too much emphasis on that top-down approach and not enough on just um, self-reliance and, and really listening to your body and listening to your feelings and, you know, and understanding how you um, respond to food and, um, so I think uh, helping people kind of um, bring that locus of control back in internally, I think is, is something really important to me. Um, and, um, you know, and I think for me, ultimately, um, it, I would describe my purpose as spiritual. Um, How because, would you describe uh, it? So for me, you know, um, what uh, um, I come from a Hindu background. Yeah. And, um, and for me, you know, I think spirituality is very much a part of uh, religion for me with, with Hinduism and uh, um, and so I think um, you know just um, self-realization uh, mm -hmm. self-actualization um, that's my my goal that I strive towards and uh, I think uh, um, that's based on you know my meditation practice and my 
um, guru, um, you know, my Ayurvedic guru and my spiritual guru and, you know, the teachers that I have in my life. So I think um, that's really what um, I consider my purpose ultimately is a, a spiritual one. Akhil Palanasamy, author of The Paleovedic Diet, and Rebecca Katz, author of The Healthy Mind Cookbook. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for being with us at okay, the New School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.